I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also is that, of, that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart to the end that we may attain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying,
psalm will be set antiphonally beginning on this side of the church. <clears throat> Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come unto thee. I will not finish from thee in the time of my trouble. Incline thy ear unto me when I call. O hear me, and that I too. For my days are consumed away like smoke, and my bones are burnt up as it were a fire burn. My heart is smitten down and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. For the voice of my groaning, my bones. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook of Sherith, that is, before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Sherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, 
which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And she was going to fetch it, and he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her, and she said, As the Lord liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did accordingly to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow whom thy, with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. And the Lord, Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Here endeth the first lesson.
I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Here beginneth the 11th verse of the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, Jesus went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and through all the region round about. Here endeth the second lessons.
be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the state. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. And bless thy inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. For it is now, Lord, only that makes us well in safety. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O Lord, we beseech thee, let thy continual pity cleanse and defend thy church. And because it cannot continue in safety without thy succor, preserve it evermore by thy help and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States, and to all in authority, wisdom and strength to know and to do thy will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the Creator and Preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech Thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that Thou wouldst be pleased to make Thy ways known unto them, Thy saving help unto all nations. More especially, we pray for Thy Holy Church, universal, that it may be so guided and governed by Thy good Spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate. That it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings, and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Of your charity, I bid your prayers for the repose of the souls of the faithful departed. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord. And that thy perpetual shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord, to make our common supplications unto thee, and has promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world 
knowledge of thy truth, and the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Sunday after Trinity. Good morning also to our online viewers. It's good to be back after missing last Sunday due to ill health. And thank you for various messages of support I received. I'm not 100%, but I'm certainly getting there. A uh, few things to uh, take note of. First, really, and I'm sorry, especially I wasn't here last Sunday, uh, for Jonathan Murphy's first outing on the bench as our interim organist and choir master. Uh, I want to extend a very warm welcome to him, and I hope that you, as you have opportunity, will also welcome him yourselves personally. Um, uh, it's a big thing to be succeeding Stephen Brannion, uh, and uh, we're grateful that Jonathan has been willing to uh, step into those big shoes. I know he will do so uh, with great skill and dedication. Uh, we're in the middle of stewardship season. Uh, most of you, I trust, have received a stewardship mailing with a pledge card therein. Uh, please think about that carefully and uh, return that pledge card to us uh, at a good time uh, so that we can uh, complete the campaign and move forward with making a responsible budget. Um, we have wonderful ministries going on here at St. John's. Uh, we do so in an economic climate that is not altogether favorable. Um, I'm looking to each one of you to consider carefully what you can do to support us in the coming year. Um, next Sunday, uh, as our custom is, we'll keep the Feast of Michaelmas with brass, and if you'd like to make a donation towards the brass, those intentions will be printed in next week's parish paper. And there will be even song, of course, uh, followed by reception in the Green Melbourne House. Uh, but this Tuesday is the men's annual meeting and uh, uh, time of uh, fellowship. Um, and we have a guest speaker, Father Will Brown, from the only other 1928 prayer book parish in Georgia, which is All Saints uh, uh, Thomasville. Uh, and he will be speaking to us out of his own perspective as a dedicated outdoorsman um, and uh, reflections on faith and nature should be of interest. Please RSVP as soon as possible. Uh, we're very up to date. We've got a QR code in the back of the booklet. If you know how to use a QR code, you're all set. Uh, and if you don't, there's a phone number or you can call the church office. But do let us know so the men can provide adequately uh, for uh, the kind of refreshments that the men of St. John's like to have. And with that, I think we're ready for our hymn before the sermon, hymn 376, Come Down, O Love Divine.
Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Nain was a very small place, probably about 200 people not far away from Nazareth, a place of no importance until Jesus came to town. He was on his way through Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom in every place, both great and small. And as he enters into Nain, he meets a funeral procession coming out. It's the body of a young man, the only son of his mother, and she a widow. Um, something that I'm sure it, they were able to discover very easily. And because she's a widow and because this is her only son, the pain of loss and grief uh, that already is present is much greater because in an ancient and patriarchal society, the family is your social safety net and uh, a man, either a husband, a father, or a son, is a necessary support, stay, and protection for a woman. And so she's looking, walking into a very gray and bleak future. And in a certain sense, therefore, she kind of stands for the human condition in its most vulnerable and poignant, um, this procession into sorrow, this uh, movement forward to the grave. And Jesus looks at her. And, you know, that's where it always starts. When we look away, that's when we've decided we don't want to see that. When we look away from misery, that's when we've already decided we don't want to open our hearts. But Jesus looks at her, and he opens his heart to her. He has compassion on her. And then he does some things that are really quite startling. Um, first of all, he tells her not to weep. And you might say, well, she's got very good reason to weep. Why are you telling her not to weep? And then he puts his hand on the bier in which the body of the young man is being carried. And that's just the kind of action that drove the Pharisees crazy, because they were all about ritual purity. And the last thing you do is incur ritual defilement unnecessarily as, for instance, by contact with a dead body. But Jesus doesn't care about such things. And instead of uh, stepping aside, therefore, and letting the procession go through and averting his eyes and closing his heart, he's brought the procession to a halt. And if that's not startling enough, what happens next is even more so. Because at this point, he speaks to the dead man and tells him to get up. Uh, if you've ever had your <coughs> parents try to summon you from your adolescent slumbers, perhaps you have some of the flavor of this. And young man, I say unto thee, arise. And the young man gets up, and Jesus restores, her, uh, restores him to his, his, no doubt, astounded and amazed mother. And the whole crowd in that narrow village lane explodes in praise, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God hath visited his people. You see what Jesus has done. Here's this movement, this movement towards death, which is the whole movement of the creation. And Jesus gets in the way and tells it, stop. And not only brings it to a stop, but turns it around, reverses the whole course of history, reverses the whole course of on which we seem to be set towards the grave, towards darkness, towards sorrow, towards hopelessness, and turns it around in a way that brings glory to God. That's the action of Jesus. And the crowd is right to see that it is the action of God himself, who is not remote, but, uh, but close, not absent, but present, and in compassion and command is taking charge and reversing the whole wretched course of our sad history and setting it on a new course for life. So it's the gospel in miniature. That's 
the gospel that Jesus was proclaiming. That's the gospel which the church proclaims and which we perhaps believe. Uh, the compassion of God, who is able to do abundantly, exceeding abundantly ab above all that we ask and think, which is um, uh, mediated and revealed to us by Christ in the redemption and restoration of his people to the praise of his glory. That's the gospel. So for us, wherever we are as believers or half-believers or maybe thinking about believing, um, the, the question for us is that what Christ has accomplished for us, what is already, you might say, out there in the world, already accomplished for us in history and is proclaimed in the gospel, the question for us, of course, is how can it be accomplished in me? I know there it is, proclaimed, it's out there. How can it get inside me? How can I be filled with all the fullness of God? And of course, our ultimate hope is the resurrection body when God shall be all in all. Last week, when I was dealing with a kidney stone that wouldn't pass, I was thinking a resurrection body would be a nice thing to have. <laughs> but everything in its own time. Uh, the, re the, the redemption, the filling of um, human beings with the fullness of God begins here and now in a way that is not visible or um, tangible or embodied, but actually uh, with the transformation of our inward being. That's what Paul is, uh, is, what Paul is praying for in today's epistle lesson. He's praying that what is already present in the world, in the action of God, may become inwardly present to us. So that what God has done in Israel 2,000 years ago in Jesus Christ may touch this individual life subjectively, may transform me from the inside out. And we know how that transformation happens, of course. It's by faith in Jesus. But for us to believe in what God has done in Jesus and to respond to it, that's actually beyond human power. We're not actually capable of doing that unaided. That itself, that we should believe, respond to what God has done with faith in the gospel, that itself requires a miracle of God. Because there's never a point when God says, well, you know, here I've done all this work for your salvation, now you take the ball and run with it. I'm finished, now it's your turn. No, the work of salvation is the work of God from beginning to end, and he is involved, essentially involved at every step of it, and most certainly in our own decision to entrust ourselves to Christ and to the gospel by faith. That act of faith, to, me, to repeat, is something that we are not humanly capable of. It must be evoked in us by God himself. And that, St. Paul says, is the work, strengthening work of the Holy Spirit in our weakness, God at work within me, prompting me and enabling me to put my faith in Christ. So that's, we've got what Christ, the gospel, what Christ has accomplished for us in the world, and then how that is going to be accomplished in us from the inside out, beginning with faith, that is the gift of the Spirit. But then we need to say, well, how does this transformation look, what does this inward transformation look like that begins uh, with the work of the Spirit in evoking in us faith in the gospel? Paul says something which is probably one of the most famous verses of scripture. Uh, he says, the result of the Spirit's work is that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. And in a revivalistic traditions, of course, uh, that's where Christ lives. He actually doesn't, you know, that language is so common that it's, this is actually striking to know this is the only place in the entire Bible where it's mentioned. Um, and I remember once talking, asking a young pious girl from a pious family 
where Christ lived. And she said, in my heart, as if somehow that was the natural place. And in fact, of course, he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father, right? So we've got this very strong cultural bias to think, well, of course Christ lives in your heart. Where else would he live? And we stop thinking about it. What we need to do is catch a hold of how surprising it is to say that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith. And we need to think, what does that mean? Um, and the verb there uh, that's dwell is as a specific um, nuance of meaning. Uh, to dwell doesn't mean to pass through, to stay for the night, to make a visit. It doesn't refer to some transient experience. It's, it has the nuance of settling down making this your home and making it your home, not as a guest, you might say, but as the host. To talk about Christ dwelling in our hearts, therefore, is to talk about the uh, a profound and far-reaching reorientation of our entire personality. Uh, a reorientation of our mind and will, of our thinking and doing, um, a recentering of our entire personality, a reintegration of all the parts of our personality around a new center, which is Christ. So, in that sense, you see, there's Christ is not someone we keep at a safe distance where we can let him know when he's needed which is, of course, the state of North American religion today. No, it's about saying Christ's proper place is actually at the center of all my thinking and all my choosing, all my willing. And the result of that indwelling of Christ is this reorientation of which I've already mentioned. But Paul speaks about it in these wonderful terms. He says in his prayer that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So um, first he says we're going to be if you, if you have if by the Spirit's work you have faith in Christ and he dwells within, then you are rooted and grounded in love. Rooted like a plant in fertile, uh, well-watered soil where it can flourish and bear fruit. Grounded like a building that is set upon a sure foundation that cannot be washed away in the flood or shaken by earthquake. Anchored in the fundamental reality of God's kingdom, which is God's love for us, revealed in Jesus Christ, and our consequent love for each other. That's the whole character of our life, uh, which, in which we are grounded and rooted um, uh, by faith in the gospel. But then Paul talks about four dimensions, breadth, length, depth, and height. And it's not, he doesn't state what it's the four dimensions of. And people have debated for centuries about various possibilities. Do these four dimensions refer to the infinite wisdom and power of God pervading the whole cosmos? Does it refer to the vast scope of God's saving purposes? Are these the dimensions of the spiritual temple and heavenly Jerusalem foreseen by the prophets? Is this a description of the church throughout time and eternity? Is it a reference to the four arms of the cross? Perhaps, in some sense, it is all of these things. But as Paul goes on to speak about knowing the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, I think that really is where we need to conclude that the love revealed indeed on the four arms of the cross, which indeed has a scope pervading uh, the entire cosmos binds together Jew and Gentile in a new spiritual temple, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
in his arms stretched out on the cross, we see the bread of Christ's love offered even to his enemies. In the length of the cross, we see its dur the duration of his work from time to eternity. In the depth of the cross, we see the source of his love for us in God's love for man. And in the height, we see the ultimate end of his love that we should be lifted up to that same love. The more we know of this love, the more we try to embrace its immeasurable extent, the more amazingly incomprehensible it seems. That Christ should die for sinners, this is indeed a knowledge of the love of Christ which passeth knowing. My final point. The knowledge of Christ's love certainly involves the mind and the intellect. If you're not engaged in the practice of reading scripture thoughtfully and prayerfully, if you're not engaged in the process of learning Christian doctrine, then you are not engaged in knowing the love of Christ, and you need to do it. It also involves the will and the affections, the moral reformation in the likeness of Christ, and through the struggle for obedience to God's holy will and commandments. And that too, if you're not engaged in that struggle, if you're not acknowledging the claim of a Christ on your obedience, then you have not begun to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. And all this happens inward. But as I say, it happens from the inside out. And indeed, in a certain sense, therefore, from the outside in. The renewal of mind and will in the individual has its proper context, as Paul reminds us, in the corporate fellowship and worship of the church. It is with all saints, which is to say all God's holy people, that we are enabled to comprehend what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And it is in the church by Christ Jesus that glory is rendered to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or speak or, or think. So Paul's prayer that we may be risen with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, that we may be rooted and grounded in love, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, that we may be enabled to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's a lot to ask for. Is it too much? Paul doesn't think so. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And, as Austin Ferrer put it, we do not come to God for a little help, a little support for our own good intentions. We come to him for resurrection. God will not be asked for little. He will be asked for all. Let this asking be our earnest and unceasing prayer. Amen.
thine unworthy servants to give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we shall forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and evermore. Amen. Amen.